Welcome to the Pest Management Webinar brought to you by South Coast NRM in partnership with ASHEEP. The Australian Government Regional Land Care Partnerships is funding the webinar tonight as part of the Ramsar Recovery Catchment Project. The project aims to maintain and improve the ecological character of the Ramsar wetlands with our focus on the Lake Warden and Lake Gore catchments. I'm Kate Pickering, a project officer here at South Coast NRM and I'll be moderating the webinar tonight. Just a few notes before we begin. We will be recording this webinar and uploading to South Coast NRM's YouTube channel. We will make the link available so you and others can access the recording at any time. We will try to incorporate questions throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box at any time. You can open the chat box by clicking the button labelled chat. There will also be time at the end of the webinar for any questions that were missed. Please keep your sound on mute and your video turned off throughout the webinar as we can have poor internet connection from time to time. Presenting tonight's webinar is Dean from Animal Pest Management Services and Erica Ayres from A-Sheep. Dean will discuss methods of rabbit, fox and cat control and Erica will be outlining common livestock diseases, including symptoms and management options for small property owners. Dean Butcher is based in Bunbury and has been working in the industry for nine years as a licensed pest management technician and logistics coordinator. With a font of knowledge in all aspects of fauna handling and relocation, trapping and baiting to maintaining and implementing feral animal programs. The Animal Pest Management Services has been, running, has been operating for over 20 years, specialising in pest control in a variety of environments across Australia. Erica Ayres is a local sheep and cattle farmer east of Esperance. She is a qualified vet by profession and works with sheep, with a sheep on health and biosecurity issues. A sheep is an Esperance based producer group that focuses on local sheep, cattle and pasture production. The organisation has been running for over 20 years, discussing issues and conveying relevant livestock information within the Esperance region. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Dean to discuss pest management. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'll just bring up the uh, slideshow now. might just have an issue with the screen share being disabled. No problem. Just give me five seconds. Try that now. All right. You see that okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, so this presentation is uh, for feral animal control. Um, most of the presentation will be focused around foxes, though we will touch on feral cats and rabbits as well. Um, the information in the presentation is mostly aimed towards landholders and control on properties, and most of it can be applied to all areas where feral animal control might be required. So a couple of the things uh, that we'll be going through I'll just go over a couple of quick fox facts, a bit of background. Uh, some keys to effective control, considering methodology for foxes, baiting options for foxes, how to actually begin the baiting process, methodology for rabbits, control options for rabbits, and a bit on feral cat control. So I won't go through too many of the fox 
facts. Um, one important aspect to remember, especially when considering timing of baiting though, will be the, um, the mating for foxes, which is generally around May to July, uh, though this can change in dependent on food availability and day length. Um, and that the females usually only breed once per year. Uh, another important uh, fact that the home ranges for foxes can vary quite considerably between around 30 hectares up to 1,600 hectare hectares, depending on the environment. And they are estimated to eat around 400 grams of food per night, including 150 kilos a year, which is quite considerable. So some keys for effective control. Have a clear target of what the problem is and what outcomes you want to achieve. There are five major steps in the formulation of successful pest control programs. And these apply from landholders right up to uh, substantial programs. One is to define the actual problem. Determine the objective, determine the control options, implement the management plan, monitor, evaluate, and modify if needed. So there are a number of aspects to consider when determining the most suitable methodology based on the circumstances. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but uh, it can, it's good to consider everything from the, the target species themselves, uh, the location of the property, proximity to public roads, infrastructure, housing, neighbours, caravan parks, uh, public access, neighbouring properties, uh, any property restrictions you may have, and then approvals, permits and trainings that may be required for different methodologies. So the methodology options available for fox control include exclusion fencing, den fumigation, shooting, trapping, and baiting. So I'll go through some pros and cons for each of those methodologies, starting with the exclusion fencing it can restrict access of foxes into particular areas, for example, important or sensitive areas that may include species such as chickens or native fauna. It can provide long-term and permanent control. Some of the cons for exclusion fencing include, uh, it can be quite expensive. It doesn't solve the problem of fox populations. You can actually fence in foxes, and it's not suitable for most property boundaries. Den fumigation, some pros for den fumigation. You can effectively and humanely destroy foxes while they sleep. It is relatively cost effective and can be effective for targeting individual foxes. Some cons for den fumigation, it does require the known whereabouts of the actual active dens. Not all foxes will be living in dens and the fox may not be in the den at the time of fumigation. Uh, so it does require confirmation. And oftentimes, uh, particularly in the lead up to breeding season, it may just be the fact that the foxes are um, preparing their dens or moving between various different dens. So it's something that you do need to confirm before fumigating. Uh, den fumigation also requires that the uh, location be on the property that you're targeting. Um, oftentimes foxes may be moving from neighboring properties. It's generally used as an ad hoc method in combination with other control. Um, and another one that's not listed there is that the fumigate itself is um, can be hard to acquire. So shooting for foxes, uh, some pros for shooting, it's target specific obviously, 
It's low to nil risk to non-target species. It is an effective option when trapping and baiting is not suitable. There is no permits or poisons required. Some cons for shooting. It is often used as a last resort or in combination with other methods, uh, particularly if baiting and trapping isn't suitable. Shooting is labor intensive. The close proximity of neighbors can be an issue and it's not usually effective in reducing populations or for long-term control. Fox trapping, uh, some pros include it being very effective in removing small populations or individual foxes. There is no poisons or toxins required, it is non-lethal, and there is low risk to domestic animals and native fauna. Cons of fox trapping include the requirement of daily checking of traps. Cage traps are generally ineffective in capturing adult foxes or can take weeks and in cases up to months. It can result in trap shy foxes and it is labor intensive and can be expensive. Fox baiting. Some pros for fox baiting include more suitable for broader scale control. A variety of bait types can be used. Can be low risk to native animals. Effective control with labor expenses compared to trapping and shooting. Effective for long-term control and minimizing reinvasion. And baits can be effective after rainfall if using certain baits. Some cons for fox baiting include domestic dogs are often at highest risk with fox baits. It requires exclusion, muzzling, and the correct bait selection. The use of toxins and poisons on the property. You may uh, have baits that are caged by foxes it does require training, permits, and neighbor notifications, and not suitable in high risk or high traffic areas. So with fox baiting, there is a variety of different types of baits. These include dried meat baits, manufactured or processed baits, egg baits, and CPEs or canid pest injectors. Each product has their benefit as well as flaws. There's not really one perfect bait. Um, they do include, but not limited to palatability, longevity, removability, recovery, availability. Um, they all have their um, sort of their pros and cons for each bait type. In general, in domestic type situations, such as smaller private properties where domestic dogs or cats are often present, 1080 egg baits are usually recommended for foxes. So for CPEs, what is a CPE? That's what they look like there. Um, you can see the actual device on the left with the lure and lure head attached. On the right is the picture of the device buried in the ground without the lure. So you can see that they're sort of buried in the ground. It contains a lure head and capsule that sits above the ground. Uh, through extensive trials through ACTA, Animal Control Technologies Australia, uh, the CP is supposedly only activated by canines, such as foxes and dogs and therefore is safe for non-target native fauna. While the device can be activated by domestic dogs, the baits cannot be cached like other baits such as eggs or dry meat baits, therefore leaving the property 1080 free once the CPEs have been removed. As CPEs still pose a risk to domestic dogs, it is recommended that they are either muzzled or restricted access from the baiting areas during the baiting period. 
Some of the pros for CPEs, um, they are activated by an upwards pulling force approximately 1.6 to 2.7 kilos. They are only activated by animals that will pull upwards, such as canines. There is a low risk of activation by native species. There's not enough dosage of 1080 to affect most native species. They come in three milligram and six milligram 1080 capsules. They are reusable by replacing lure head and or 1080 capsule. You can use a variety of different lures. The 1080 capsules themselves are resistant to rain and wet ground. And you can actually also use them with PAP capsules instead of 1080. The CPEs cannot be caged, so they cannot be taken away for later consumption. You can confirm activation and therefore estimate actual individual foxes kill. They are less likely that the fox will activate or take multiple CPEs once it has triggered one, unlike with other baits. It can be removed at the end of the program and the property left 1080 free, which is probably one of the best positives uh, about CPEs. And there are also a higher maximum lay rate compared to other fox baits. So you can lay up to 20 per 100 hectares compared with five for other baits such as egg baits and dried meat baits. Some of the cons for CPEs, they, there is a significant outlay cost. They do cost over $50 per device. There is a high risk to domestic dogs. Uh, children may pull on them. It requires domestic dogs to be restricted from or muzzled if on a baited site. The device does require maintenance. We find that um, depending on the ground, especially, especially coastal areas, that they require more maintenance. Like any device, they can malfunction and result in no fire. The devices themselves may be stolen and they are more labor intensive and expensive than using regular baits. Some of the uh, other cons for CPEs, it does require the removal of the device if you're finishing a baiting program. And we have found that crows can be an issue in removing the lures. So one of the other baiting options is the 1080 egg bait. Pros for the egg baits include that they can be effective for up to six weeks and in some cases, three months. They are unaffected by rain and moist soil. There is a low risk to non-target species, including domestic dogs. Um, most dogs are unlikely to sniff out and dig up and, and eat entire eggs, especially considering the eggs uh, are buried. They do uh, minimize the relocation of, um, by other animals, including birds. They are readily available, cheap to produce and purchase. And eggshell remains at the bait site can suggest consumption via fox. Some of the cons for egg baits include caching by foxes, which is usually uh, a little bit higher than most other baits. You cannot guarantee that uh, the property will be 1080 free even after removing the baits due to caching. The baits are sometimes consumed by goannas, although the goannas will be unaffected by the level, level of 1080. The baits can sometimes be relocated by non-target species such as birds. So dry meat baits, uh, that picture there is obviously when the dry meat baits themselves are still wet or fresh. Uh, usually made up of kangaroo. Some of the pros for dry meat baits, they can be effective for up to six months without rain. Uh, tethering to ensure that no native non-target animals can remove the baits. 
readily available and cheap to purchase and can have a much higher bait uptake compared with other bait types. Some of the cons for dry meat bait is they are affected by rain. There is a higher risk to non-target species, including domestic dogs. Baits will be more attractive and palatable to dogs. They will also be more obvious and easier to find. So alternative to 1080 is the PAP baits. PAP are only currently available as manufactured or processed baits for foxes and wild dogs, or as I mentioned before in CPE capsule. Uh, it's not a replacement to 1080, but an additional tool. The affected animal will quickly become unconscious and die, though an animal that suffers a less than lethal dose experiences temporary lethargy and then recovers to normal within hours. Some of the pros for pat baits include that an animal that suffers a um, less than lethal dose can recover within hours. There is a small margin of safety for some pets and working dogs in that the fox baits themselves have a dose of 400 milligrams of pap, which is more than enough to kill a five to seven kilo fox, but may not be enough to kill a large dog. There is obviously still a risk to uh, smaller dogs. Buried baits can last several weeks, uh, longer than 1080 baits, which is usually only one to two baits for manufactured baits. Sorry, one to two weeks. There is no risk of secondary poisoning due to the low residue left in carcasses. And probably the biggest pro for pat baits is the blue healer antidote or methylene blue, which is uh, in injected intravenously. It, it is commercially available as a human medicine uh, or from vets. Uh, and you may also be able to induce vomiting to accidentally poison dogs. Cons for pat baits, although it's uh, very humane, the, the time to death is typically 45 to 90 minutes. So you do need to ask, uh, act fast for accidentally poisoned pets. And that's actually the time from consumption of the bait, not, not from uh, symptoms, uh, which means it may not be possible to administer the antidote fast enough in remote areas. A ready-to-use antidote is not yet available for dog owners. PAP dog baits is a lethal dose for any size dog. And same as 1080, properties using PAP should muzzle or restrain dogs. Some native animals are vulnerable to PAP, uh, including goannas, quolls and bandicoots. The pet baits are generally more expensive than 1080 baits and less readily available. So once you've sort of decided what type of bait, uh, how often you're going to bait, you're going to want to look at um, how to actually begin baiting. So to, to bait yourself as a landholder, you'll need to complete the approved user training, which is online through the DPIRD website. Uh, it's only a, I think about a 15 or 20 minute uh, online course. Once you've completed that, you'll need to submit a 1080 RCP or restricted chemical product permit application. You will need to send that along with a property, with a map of your property that highlights things such as uh, exclusion zones, warning sign locations, boundaries, water points, that sort of thing. Um, all of this information is available on the website and will be included in the online training. You will then need to complete neighbor notifications between two to 14 days before starting the bait. You'll need to erect warning signs in required locations and purchase baits from an S7 retailer listed on the permit. 
you will be able to list um, up to three S7 retailers, which you will need to get in hold uh, before you actually submit the permit because you need the details of the retailers. And then obviously you'll need to carry out baiting as per legislation and permit requirements. And I should say that this is for uh, 1080 baiting, uh, the same thing for foxes applies to rabbits and um, feral pigs and the same. So uh, for rabbits, the methodology for rabbit, um, things to consider include um, the extent of damage they are doing, uh, how many there are, where they are, for example, if they're living in warrens, if they're living above ground in shrubs, or if they're coming from next door, uh, and what domestic or non-target animals are on the property or on neighboring properties. Some of the control options for rabbits, um, for, for poisons, there's two poisons. The first one is 1080. Um, it should only really be used on large properties with no or low risk to domestic animals, such as dog or stock, such as cattle and sheep. 1080 baits are safe for native animals, such as kangaroos and quenda. As with fox baiting, rabbit baiting with 1080 is restricted in certain areas. It requires landowners to complete 1080 training uh, unless the, the baiting itself is going to be done by LPMT. Uh, requires a 1080 permit and the 1080 will be rendered ineffective with rainfall. Uh, 1080 baiting is most effective when applied in late spring through to summer. Pindone baiting is the other option for poison control for rabbits. Uh, it's effective when 1080 is impractical or unsuitable, for example, residential, urban or semi-rural areas. It's not recommended on properties that have kangaroos or bandicoots as kangaroos and quenda are highly susceptible to pindone, uh, as well as birds and cats. It does require multiple feeds over a period of approximately four to 12 days. It does not require neighbor notifications, formal training or licenses or approvals, uh, but it is recommended that neighbors be notified by telephone. It's also recommended that properties destock paddocks and muzzle domestic dogs likely to eat the bait or dead rabbits. Pindone will also be rendered ineffective with rainfall and is most effective when applied in late spring and summer. There is biological control options for rabbits, including RHDV, uh, similar to the Khaleesi virus, which is released either by hand with the virus mixed with feed or by infected rabbits. It is completely safe for use. It is target specific. It affects no other species other than European rabbits. Effective method control when fumigation and or poisons are not effective or suitable for the area. Rabbit control on neighboring properties will assist as well. Uh, under the regulations, anyone that's handling or mixing the virus must complete online training on DPIRD's website to become authorised. The virus can potentially spread over vast areas. And the new K5 strain of the virus showed an average of production of around 35 to 40%. So it's not likely to wipe out entire populations. Uh, it's most effective when released in the cooler months, such as late spring and autumn. Another option for control is for rabbits is fumigation. Um, it can be highly effective. Uh, rabbits can be difficult to find or access in dense vegetation. Rabbits are in the southwest 
often live above ground in vegetation and in some areas more than 75% of rabbits may live above ground. Uh, rabbit fumigation is effective if warrens are being utilised by rabbits on the property. Fumigation is a low risk and often cost effective solution to reducing rabbit numbers on small scale properties, particularly when other options such as poisons are not suitable or in winter when they are less effective. Uh, fumigation can be effective throughout the year, though is most effective when warren use is high. Another control option for rabbits is ripping. Um, I won't really go through all of the details about warren ripping. Uh, there's plenty of sort of information online about it. Um, the, the sort of most important part about rabbit ripping is that the aim is actually to just destroy the warren so that uh, to avoid reinvasion by rabbits, not to actually kill the rabbits through ripping. Um, if majority of the rabbits do live above ground, ripping may not be effective in reducing their numbers. There are obviously uh, animal welfare considerations that should be made prior to considering ripping as an option. So usually you want to consider using one of the other control methods such as 1080 baiting, uh, pin down or fumigation before carrying out ripping. Other options for rabbits uh, include shooting, trapping and exclusion fencing. These methods are more labour intensive and expensive and for large size properties, shooting and trapping should be considered an ad hoc approach and is generally ineffective. Uh, fencing should be considered long-term exclusion, though the cost can far outweigh doing un ongoing control. And you also need to consider fencing in rabbits. So a little bit um, on feral cats. Feral cats are a declared pest in WA under the BAM Act. They are defined as cats living and re reproducing in the wild, not owned or socialized and survive on their own in the wild by hunting. There is recognized control methods uh, for feral cats, which include exclusion fencing, baiting, trapping with cage traps and shooting. Generally baiting is not available and shooting is ineffective. Uh, landowners should refer to their local shire regarding the laws and requirements for trapping for cats. Although not technically required, neighbours should be notified of the trapping. Captured cats should be checked for microchips, collars and registration tags and should be dealt with in accordance of relevant regulations. Domestic cats should either be released immediately or handed to the local ranger or owner. And feral cat control must be carried out in accordance with Animal Welfare Act 2002. The main control option for feral cats is cage trapping. Uh, this can also apply to foxes, though not um, the most effective method. Uh, it is considered ineffective for large areas. It can be suitable for urban, residential or semi-rural properties where individual cats are to be targeted or where there are no other options for control. Traps can cause unnecessary stress and harm. Ensure traps are set in the afternoon or evening and checked early the next day. Avoid adverse weather such as extreme heat or rain or storms. Neighbours should be notified prior to avoid capture of domestic cats. Cats that have been determined as being feral must be euthanised in a humane manner in accordance with relevant animal welfare regulations. Euthanasia should be performed by either an authorised person, person at an animal shelter, council pound, vet, or shot while in the cage in a safe location by a skilled operator with the necessary firearm accreditation and experience. 
Trap cats or non-target animals should be approached as quietly as possible to avoid further stress, panic or injury. If transporting cats or any other animals, provide a cover over the cage to provide shelter and minimize visual stress. Um, minimize trapping during September to March to avoid capturing lactating females. If lactating females are captured, ensure every effort to locate and humanely destroy or hand to an animal shelter any kittens. Non-target animals captured should be examined for injury, illness or distress. Unharmed animals should be released immediately. Suffering animals should, be re should receive appropriate attention and held in a suitable holding area for recovery, or if treatable injuries are present, should be handed to a vet or wildlife carer. Traps should be set on the flat ground, clear of vegetation at the entrance of the trap, and some sort of backing to avoid animals taking the bait from the rear. Bait should be replaced regularly to maintain freshness and appeal, as well as minimizing being affected by ants. Uh, so that actually um, concludes the presentation on the wildlife um, and feral animal control options. Uh, so I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Kate. Perfect. Thanks for that, Dean. Uh, thanks for your insight on small property pest control and the in-depth uh, options for fox, cat and rabbit control. I'd just like to mention again, if you have any questions, please utilise the chat box at any time. Uh, so if there's no further questions, I'll hand you over to Erica to discuss all things livestock. Okay, good evening. Um, a sheep has asked me to present to you today. Um, they are currently involved in a national research project, preparing for and preventing an incursion of emergency animal diseases into Australia. Now, the project is modelled on foot and mouth disease, which I've just got a couple of pictures um, of animals and lesions associated with foot and mouth disease. Now, the reason that this is used as the, the targeted disease or the, the model um, is the first being that if we can prevent the introduction and spread and effectively control foot and mouth disease, then we can manage pretty much all diseases that are out there because it is such a highly infectious disease. The second reason is that FMD, foot and mouth disease, really is the COVID-19 of animal diseases in that it would decimate our livestock industries overnight and shut down all our export markets. And I guess finally, you know, there is a very um, planned and major system in, in place that would swing into action in the case of you know, foot and mouth disease being detected. So look, the major, the major role for producers and all owners of livestock within the project is to build capacity in the surveillance of our stock. The rapid detection of foot and mouth disease or other, other diseases um, and a quick and effective response will exponentially reduce the impact on our industries. As livestock producers, we are very interdependent on each other, um, and this includes small landholders. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a couple of sheep running around the back paddock or, you know, thousands in a commercial operation. We all depend on each other to, um, to have an understanding of what to look for who to contact if we see unusual signs of disease. And I guess the other important point to touch on is animal welfare issues. If we own livestock, it's really important um, that we are responsible for their health and wellbeing. Um, there's just no, no place for suffering or poor welfare outcomes for animals. 
So, look, if you see signs of unusual disease or you're concerned about the health of your animals and don't know why, um, your point of contacts include the local veterinary clinic, uh, the DPIRD or Department of Primary Industries vets, there's an emergency animal disease hotline, um, and there is potentially subsidies available in certain circumstances to investigate diseases. So, you know, all of those people um, that I've referred to can point you in the right direction as to how to go about solving the problem. Now, this is a flyer, which I'll give you a, a reference to later in the presentation um, that a sheep has produced, but it really is targeting small land owners um, and recognising that we are very much interdependent um, in terms of disease control. So there's lots of really good information on, on there. So I guess things to consider if you have or are considering getting a few livestock for your property. The first is, is your property registered with a PIC or a property identification code? This is actually a legal requirement to own livestock and provides an identification and traceability system. So very much like um, we're required to microchip our cats and our dogs these days. It's essential for buying, selling, and transporting animals, but also in disease control in the case of an outbreak of disease. So if you go on and Google WA PIC, that will take you to the Department of Primary Industries website. It's a very simple and easy process and all the information is available on there as to how to go about it. So the next thing to think about is to have a biosecurity plan in place. Many of the diseases that we deal with on a daily basis in our livestock systems are highly infectious and that's by far the easiest option is to stop the introduction of the diseases onto your property um, so that they're not, you know, they're not a problem. So a biosecurity plan looks at stopping the introduction it addresses managing diseases that happen to be present and it's re reducing the risk of spread to others. So things to think about if you're introducing animals to your property, um, inspect closely for signs of ill health, such as a dull coat, poor body condition, scouring or lameness. Check for identification. All stock must be identified and registered. So you can see in this cow, um, she's earmarked in the left ear and has a Nils tag in the right ear. So that is a electronic tag, um, which, yeah, will identify that animal back to um, the pick number and the place of origin. Really important to know their history have they been vaccinated? When were their last lice and worm treatments? And have an understanding of the property history um, with diseases such as foot rot and yonis. Finally, it is recommended to isolate new introductions to a property for up to seven days um, in case they are incubating disease. Um, and to quarantine, drench new arrivals, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Critical that they, they have access to adequate nutrition and fresh water. So, you know, we need to have an understanding of the quantity and quality of food on offer. Fresh green pastures, as in the, you know, the picture below, uh, is adequate for all types of livestock um, where, you know, if you've got dry rank weeds such as love grass or bull rushes, that's unlikely to maintain, you know, any animals including dry stock. In 
our climate, um, summer and autumn dry feed is um, often a problematic time. We find that dry feed deteriorates with time um, and especially with leaching rainfall events which um, leach the nutrients from the feed. So at those times of year, supplementation is very often required to maintain animals. Nutrition is a, is a huge subject, but just a couple of key points to think about. Young growing animals have high protein requirements, much higher than, um, than adult stock. Where pregnant and lactating females, energy um, intake becomes really critical. For example, in a pregnant or lactating ewe, um, their energy requirements double. Um, and if they're raising twins or triplets, you know, it can actually be triple that of a dry animal. So they need a really high quality source of, of energy. Fibre or roughage um, is critical for rumen function and to prevent sand impaction. So it's recommended sort of a minimum of about 10 to 15% of a rumen, ruminant's diet is made up of roughage. So typically we, for, we feed hay um, to supplement roughage. And trace elements on our coastal sand plain to think about is vitamin B12, selenium and copper. Um, which are especially critical in young growing stock, but calcium and magnesium also become important in um, lambing ewes particularly. Probably the biggest issue, health issue that we see in small land holdings um, is worms. So there's two major types of worms that we very, very commonly see scour worms and barbus pole worm. Scour worms, typically the animals will look much like um, what you're looking at on your screen. They'll very often be scouring, ill thrifty, just not growing and you know, healthy as we, um, as we would like them to be, you know, right through to being weak and, and dying. Um, in contrast, barbus pole worm actually suck blood from the sheep. Um, so animals in good condition can, you know, die quite rapidly. You know, it's not uncommon with a barber's pole outbreak that the first sign that you see is dead sheep in the paddock. And they're not, you know, they're typically not scouring and they're often in good body condition. If you examine affected animals, they tend to have pale gums and mucous membranes due to the anemia um, and in more chronically affected cases they'll often have fluid under the jaw so you know we call it a, a bottle a bottle jaw in terms of control really important to quarantine drench new animals coming on we see lots of drench resistance to the common um, Actives that we use, and you know, you don't want to int introduce resistant worms onto your property. Um, we can always, if we if we're concerned that worms are a problem, um, with a small faecal sample. So you need about a teaspoon of faeces. Um, the local vets will be able to do an egg count on that and give you an understanding of of whether or what the worm burdens in, in those animals are. Typically in a commercial situation, we do regularly drench animals. Um, lambs are always drenched at weaning and again in their first summer. Um, and typically adult sheep are summer drenched and also very often drenched pre-lambing because we get a, a reduction in natural resistance around lambing time, so that can be problematic for, for worms. Now, we are always trying to clean up paddocks, and when, so when we drench sheep, um, we've got clean or larva-free paddocks to put those animals onto. 
Um, you know, we find that in, with a drench, we're, we're killing the adult population of worms in the animals. But if we put them back onto the, the same paddocks, they're immediately becoming reinfected with the larva off the pastures. So, you know, we very quickly end up back to where we started. So typically to have confidence that we've cleaned up a, a paddock or a pasture, we, they need to be free of sheep for eight weeks in hot, dry summer conditions, um, but free of sheep for up to six months in warm, moist conditions at other times of the year. Sheep and goat share worms, so they must be drenched at the same time. Goats are particularly sensitive to worms and they require higher doses of, of drench than, um, than sheep. So, you know, always get guidance on how, you know, how to drench goats. There's also a couple of the actives that we use in sheep that can be toxic to goats as well. So, you know, speak to your supplier about recommended safe treatment options for goats. Cattle are not infected with sheep worms and vice versa. So that means that we can actually use cattle to clean up sheep pastures and vice versa. Um, but interestingly, alpacas share worms with both sheep and cattle um, and they can you know, carry them and act as, act as a source of reinfection for you know, both the other species. So the local veterinary practice here in Esperance does sell individual doses of drench and vaccine. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're not sure, if you're concerned about the worm status of your animals, um, they'll be able to do an egg count on a small sample of fresh manure. Look, I'll just very quickly touch on a, you know, a couple of the other diseases which we do see and not uncommonly. Um, foot rot, a very highly contagious bacterial infection that causes severe lameness in sheep. Um, the sheep on the left, you know, won't stand on its front feet because they're, they're just too painful. It's a notifiable disease, which means that if you're identified as having foot rot, your farm will be quarantined. Um, you'll have to go un undergo intensive treatment options and those animals um, won't be allowed to be moved elsewhere until you're cleared. Um, by far the best option is to, um, you know, is to keep it out. So, you know, inspect the, the feet of any animals that are coming onto the property. If there's signs of chronic foot abs abscessation or irritation, um, then just avoid those, those animals. Yoni's disease or OJD is another relatively common sheep disease in Esperance. Um, and again, biosecurity is critical in keeping it out. It's a disease that has a very long incubation period of between two and five years. There's no treatment available and animals waste away and die. Um, the only form of protection available is vaccination of lambs um, which gives them lifelong protection. But, you know, again, it's not a disease that you want on your property. So, you know, know the history of, of animals that are coming on. Fly strike, um, very, very common in our district. Uh, most prevalent in warm, moist conditions. So, you know, autumn and spring is usually when we get our fly waves. Best form of pre prevention is to keep the breach area free of soiling with urine or faeces, um, you know, and be really conscientious about that. Sheep, particularly at risk times, need to be very regularly monitored. Um, and in the case of strike, that, like we're looking at in the picture, um, the area needs to be shorn and treated with chemicals. I mean, incidentally, that animal there, you know, if left for, I'd suspect, sort of 36 or 48 hours beyond that strike, um, she would probably be, um, be dead. So, you know, really, really important to regularly monitor. There are long-acting chemicals available which will prevent 
fly strike for varying periods of time. So, you know, if you're, if you're having issues, then that's well worth considering. Finally, lice, um, very, very common, debilitating, highly contagious. Your best crack at effectively treating lice is um, chemically straight off shears. Um, you know, but again, another disease that really comes down to biosecurity. You know, you don't want to bring lice in because it's just an ongoing management issue. If you do, very easily spread. Um, so you're highly likely to share it with your neighbours if you've got it. Um, and they're likely to, unlikely to appreciate that. So look, just to finish up, I'll finish where I started and just briefly touch on foot and mouth disease again. It does pose real risks to Australian agriculture. And we're really unsure how many backyard pigs are out there. Um, but pigs are a particular risk in terms of foot and mouth disease. And look, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the issue with African swine fever at the moment, but transmitted in all the same ways as foot and mouth disease. A really important message is never feed food scraps under any circumstances to pigs. We find that both the foot and mouth virus and the African swine fever virus can survive for many, many months in cured meats um, and cooked meats. And if pigs have exposure to any of these meats, then they can become infected. And pigs are little powerhouses um, for virus production, so they very, very rapidly spread it to, you know, to other animals. The other risk of foot and mouth disease coming into Australia is via travellers or workers coming back from countries where foot and mouth disease is present. It will live for prolonged periods in organic material and soil. So, you know, always be, be care or care that boots and shoes are properly cleaned and disinfected and, you know, clothes and luggage and things are laundered. So finally, the department, or DPIRDS, the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, um, I'd strongly recommend their website to you. There's just a wealth of information for small landholders on there. Um, so if you Google DPIRD and small landholders, you'll, you know, there's just really credible, useful information. Um, and there's also a lot of information around livestock management and diseases, you know, targeting producers, you know, so all the diseases that we've touched on tonight, plus many more nutrition little guides, um, supplementing sheep um, guides, they're all there on that website and freely available. And there's just a reference there to the A Sheep website where you can find the small landholder flyer. And finally, A Sheep do run a number of field days, seminars, and newsletters throughout the year. And you know, these are open to anybody that is interested. Thank you. Thank you for that, Erica. That was very insightful about uh, all the livestock diseases and how to manage it on your property. I'll just give everyone a moment now if there's any last minute questions. Um, there's a question here for Erica. Are there any examples of biosecurity management plans that can be used as a template? Uh, yes, there is. Now, I'm just there is actually a very good biosecurity template, um, which, when we do our accreditation, um, tied in with. Oh, I just <laughs> momentary lapse of um, as to where I where I've sourced it. Um, 
when we do our NVD, you know, to our accreditation to to get our um, national vendor declarations and waybills. Um, look, I'm sure it, again it would be accessible through the DPED website. Um, but I, look, I can follow that up and and let Kate know um, because there is there is a great template out there, which is the one that I've used for our biosecurity plan for the property. Yeah, no problem. We can link that on the YouTube when we upload this uh, webinar. But I think if there's no further questions, I think that's all we have time for tonight. I'd like to say another thank you to presenters Dean Butcher and Erica Ayres for their time and their information. Um, thank you all for attending. Just a reminder that the recording will be available on YouTube to access this information at any time with links to the flyers and various websites that Erica mentioned. If you have any uh, further questions, please don't hesitate to contact the South Coast NRM's Esperance office on 9076 2200. Thanks again and good night.